Hey, what's up, people? This portion of the podcast, episode 64 of The Option, is brought to you by Beach Volleyball National Events. BVNE, the greatest get notice showcase in the United States of America. We have as many as 20 to 25 NCAA sand volleyball recruiters come and watch their watch our kids basically exhibition themselves and try to get recruited. Want to get noticed? Tell your mother, tell your father, tell your volleyball coach, send a telegram, <laughs> okay? BVNE, a family that plays together, stays together. It's also brought to you by NY Varsity Sports. That's me, that's me, the NYV. I break down film, that is what I do. What's the difference between me and other people that break down film? I win a lot. You want me breaking down your film. College coaches, high school coaches, for a price, I can show you how to win your games. NY Varsity Sports, watching me, watching you. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready. Episode 64, I have the NCAA All-American, Olympian, professional beach and indoor volleyball player, the enigmatic David McKenzie. And the episode starts right now. Step into a world where there's no one there but the very best no MC can test. <laughs> Woo! Yes, yes, y'all. Dave McKenzie, what's up, man? Hey, man, how are you? This is Thanks episode episode 64. This is the Option Podcast along with David McKenzie, the enigmatic David McKenzie. I am Jason DeBellius, and you are where? Tell, tell me, you tell me where before the podcast. Where are you hiding right now? Uh, I'm in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Cool, nice man. Malaysia. Yes. Nice. Can, can, Asia. How's the, um, the beach volleyball scene? Actually, do you guys play a lot of fours on the dirt? You know, out here, um, be, uh, Malaysia, there's really not any beach volleyball. Okay. And I'm uh, just looking at it now to try and build a facility, maybe out of an old uh, condominium uh, recreation center. So I'm looking at that right now. But there's just no, no places to play. So uh, unfortunately, no beach. In Singapore, they have some. That's not too far away. In Thailand, they have some. But, uh, you know, it's about an hour flight or so and not so easily accessible. So... Yeah, I get that. Let's um actually I had Ryan Millar on the I last saw, the yeah, last I, podcast and um yeah. talk to me. He was in the Olympics three times. You were in the 2012 games in London. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about your experience just being on 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 that stage and sharing the stage with with your like-minded people. First of all, Alan Knipes, the head coach, right? So he, he was also your college coach at Long Beach State, yeah, which we're definitely going to get into. Now you've played overseas. You played in Australia, this and um, uh, other places, and we're going to talk about Australia later too. So what's one of the differences? Actually, let's talk about one of the bigger differences on being on a stage like London and just being um just in, in a professional circuit we're just talking about indo and you know <laughs> we can talk about beach later we, i mean you've been around man <laughs> yeah. please you know i mean uh the olympics is is you know obviously a awesome uh awesome event and everything it's, you know everybody's dream to go there and all that um you know it's the it's the really top level stuff you know and uh differences between you know like playing professionally overseas uh you know sometimes you're on teams where things aren't so professional, you know, and they're not so organized and, and stuff like that. But then, uh, you know, when you're you're with the national team and stuff like that, I mean, everything is like really, really organized, and you know, practices are excellent. You know, all the guys are are you know playing at their at, at their best all the time, going for every ball. You know, if you're in a another place, maybe like um, Greece or something like that, you know, practices can be an, an absolute mess, and it's just like. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I played I played a lot of years in the Middle East and uh, they only bring like one professional per team out there and then the rest are like local and, uh, you know, you can have some pretty pretty bad trainings and stuff like that. Some pretty uh, crazy games where the, the point swings seven up, seven down, seven, you know, I mean, it's just, uh, it's a mess, you know, but when you, you know, uh, playing with like the national team, uh, you know, people are doing what they're supposed to do all the time and it's really awesome, you know, like a guy like me, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a role player, 
you know, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm you, able to play. You can them. play like three different positions, dude. <laughs> well, I mean, like I don't have that much responsibility. People aren't like camping out on me. You know what I mean? Like when you got like yeah. Matt Anderson or somebody yeah. out there that else, you know, they're worried about them. Then you're getting one-on-one all the time. You're not getting like, you know, triple blocked and like the two best blockers put over on you and, you know. I thought moving Matt to the right was one of the more intelligent moves. I think when you have two left side hitters, like every, in my experience, and I've been coaching 21 years, I've been an indoor player for 30, I'm 50. Um, in my experience, every tandem of outside hitters who at least won the gold or, or, or at least enjoyed success, one is like the best ball control person. Um, and like the court leader and the other one is the more explosive people. I bring your attention to maybe, let's just say Reed Pretty and Riley Simon, right? Let's yeah. say Jiba and Dante, right? Can Jiba, can Jiba yeah. hit when he wants to? Yeah, but he knew that wasn't his role. His role is to be the, the court leader, the best passer on the court. And there, there's this correlation that has that tandem of outside hitters. Karch and Stavert League, right? Stavert League um, was the best passer was voted best sure. passer because they never served Karch because Karch was better, but that's not the point. Yeah. That was his role. You know what I'm saying? Karch was the more explosive guy. So you look sure. at every team from, let's just say the 8-8 team, the Brazilian 92 team, the Netherlands, Serbia, Montenegro, you know, Gerbic and Gerbic, all the way yeah. up to 2012, that team, I thought the the balance was too tipped towards offensive explosion with Anderson and Reed Pretty. Thoughts? Oh, uh, yeah, maybe. Um, you know, I thought... Uh... We we're just trying to keep uh, the best players we could out on the court, you know, get the best players you can on the court. Right. And, uh, you know, I don't know if, uh, who, who else did we have? <laughs> you had Sean Rooney. I, I think, did you have Rooney? Oh, oh Rooney, Rooney just Rooney, yeah, Rooney yeah. and Paul, yeah. You know, I, like, I, I don't I like know. Rooney. I mean, uh, but yeah, I, I do agree. Like, uh, usually you have that one guy who's uh, just like nails and very steady. And then the other guy is kind of the, the big hitter and give him a lot of balls. But yeah. What time is it over there? Uh, 3 a.m. <laughs> okay, I promise I won't yell. I'm up here now. I'm, I'm up quite late all the time, actually. We're, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a well, night owl. Well, as yeah. you know, I'm a New Yorker, so New Yorker means night owl. I, um, I moved to California, and I knew that in order for me to do my real work, like video room breakdown and just research or whatever, I would have to do it when you put all the women, the, when you put the women and children to bed, right? The, the, yeah. the I got a three-year-old. She's a bed before nine. Yeah. My, my wife, who works in finance, she's an early person. She's at bed at 1030, and then from 1030 to 3. Um, I'm up and it's crazy because a lot of my New York friends are waking up to go to work and they're like, dude, why are you still up? And I'm like, I don't know, but I do. So I, I knew I, you I gotta, yeah. you gotta wait till everybody's asleep. It's the only time I get time to do stuff for myself as well. So first time I met you is actually New York urban. <laughs> Was it in New York? Yeah, New York Urban. You were you were super subbing uh, on a Sixes team with Elvis and um, I I think it might have been Luis Mendez. You know, remember Hustle and Flow, the setter, Hustle, uh, Luis Mendez, and there's Frankie, and those guys, Frankie uh, Valdez. Uh, um, what's his name from um from uh, Hawaii? Jason Salmeri, yes. right? Yeah, Jason, that yeah. guy. Oppo. Okay. He's an Oppo. I remember. Well, he was there, right? Yes. I came in. Uh, okay, that that open gym like at a uh, high school. Yeah, Brealey, Brealey Fieldhouse. Yeah. And you know what the cool thing is, like New York Urban has a very competitive division, Division One um, men's and women's, uh, whatever, because they're ex-college players who are lawyers. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? New York is going to have this conglomerate of um, immigrant population. This guy played in Russia. This guy played in Poland. So this, um, depending on the season, there's always going to be three solid teams. So this team, the team that you played against, actually moved up from two to one, and. They're the same team that's like, oh, if you can't handle D1 speed, then don't play, don't play. And then you walk into the gym, and the first thing they're crying is no fair. They had an Olympian. And me, I'm sitting on the bleachers because my wife is playing on the other court. She's playing women's. And me, I'm just in my suit chilling because um, I, I was coaching Hunter High School, and I, and I suit up for my games. And I said... If you can't handle the speed, if it's too fast, you should probably play D2 again. <laughs> and, but, I, I mean, your, your, your timing, because uh, everyone on this team was good. Jason was still a good player back then. He has a, he has a wicked wrist away that you, yeah. you don't put a hand there and try to slow it down. You don't, maybe you don't want to be there in position five to try to dig it. So, um, so what similarities <clears> – <throat> we, you gave me the differences. What similarities um, did you ex experience from the Olympics uh, to the pro scene? Um, not a whole well, lot, you, right? <laughs> what? Not no, a whole it's, lot. I mean, just, it's just so it's just so different, you know. I mean, uh, 
you know, I spent I, I spent half of my career uh, like in Europe, and then the last half of my career I spent a lot in the Middle East. Uh, I had like one uh, contract in Russia where I didn't get paid half my contract, so Whoa. I was like, yeah, I was over uh, doing that anymore. And I, there were some other uh, contracts too, like uh, in Greece and stuff like that, where you know, and, and also in uh, Turkey where they they like decided to penalize us at the end of the season and stuff like that. So like I was kind of over doing that in a half year contract. I mean, it was a good chunk of chunk of cash that I didn't get. So I was like, I'm done with that. And uh, those teams in the middle East, you know, they uh, guarantee your contract. So I was like, I'm, I'm going to stay here. And uh, so that's what I was saying um, in the middle East, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. Cause you're the only professional there, you know, and you're almost like a, you're almost like a, co- a player coach. You know, I, I was a player coach for sure. I mean, yeah. absolutely. You, you know, came I with would, a higher IQ. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, like I'm, I was uh, doing everything I could to try and help players get better because it made me better, made us win more and stuff like that. You know, just focusing on me uh, wouldn't do uh, that much. You know, I needed to help guys because they needed they needed help a lot, you know. And um, sometimes the coaches uh, weren't that great. I don't want to say any names or anything like that. But, you know, uh, Sometimes the way they organized practice wasn't very effective and we didn't uh, organize stuff and work and stuff at all. So I would help organize practices, just do like uh, kind of simple drills that we did with the national team. I try to integrate like some uh, cross court, like pepper stuff to warm up to get some ball control. Cause like the ball control stuff, they don't do a lot of that there, you know, and right. It's not very uh, smooth. So yeah, I mean, that's one, one big difference. I mean, if, uh, if you consider middle East volleyball, professional you know that's that's one big difference um in europe and stuff like that you well know, iran uh, looks pretty good now don't they well iran's i mean iran is is a completely different beast they're 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 strong good athletes they're serious they're professional um uh, middle east i'm talking more like about uh kuwait uae yeah okay uh bahrain's pretty good actually they have actually pretty good uh volleyball there and stuff but like uh, saudi arabia it's like uh these countries they kind of get all their national team players on one team and they have this like super stacked team. Every country has this like super stacked team. That's all national team guys. And then all the other teams is kind of like the bad news bears, (laughs) you know, and then they kind of hire one dude to come in and try and uh, win for them. And then it's it's just, it's kind of crazy, you know? So like uh, I was never on the, I never got picked for like the the top, top team with all the national team uh, dudes on there. They usually pick kind of like you were saying, like kind of like a Jiba, type mm-hmm. guy that kind of adds to the team and stuff like that. And our guys, they kind of pick the dude that let's give this guy every ball. And if we lose, it's his fault, you know? So <laughs> did you, uh, <laughs> did you ever see major league? Yeah. Charlie course. Sheen, when she handed out the baseball rosters, right. And yeah. she, she, the base, they're reading the baseball rosters. It's like all these guys are past their prime and some of them never had yeah. a prime. <laughs> and then one guy said, this guy here is dead. <laughs> and she's like, well, <laughs> well, cross him off. <laughs> that's like the, the picture I have in my head of what you're talking yeah, about. This, guy, this is the roster. Been, Wait, this guy never, died. Well, cross him that, off. Yeah, definitely something like that. <laughs> She said, she said, we'll cross him off. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> what, what, what's the problem? <laughs> so, um, I believe it is my belief in a lot of, um, you know, I've talked to many people and I, I listen to Kevin Barnett and I, I really like listening to Kevin Barnett and Dor and, um, Sunderland and, you know, as my coaching IQ got higher, I'm, 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 I'm in California and, and, and I see Nipe all the time and I, I'd like to talk to him about how much I love that guy in a minute, but yeah. And Clay Stanley, um, Reed Pretty, Lloyd Ball, and a host of other people before the Olympics in 2008 have played in Russia. But those are the three people I'm highlighting because those are the ones I knew for a fact that played in Russia before 2008. Yeah. And a lot of them contribute their, their um, mental toughness and their abilities to not make big waves crash, right? Like, uh, you know, Millar gets fired up, but he knows he's got he's to he's bring it back. Because in our experience, for every five points you get on the high, you're going to give up nine on the low. So how much is playing overseas um, internationally, regardless if it's a shit show or not, um, how much of that, of that has helped you um, play on the scene domestically? Um, let's just say the Olympics first, and then domestically on the sand a little bit and this and that. Has, has, 
Um, any of your success and mental toughness been attributed to just to just um, being in leagues where it's dog eat dog like that? Definitely. You know, um, I think, uh, you know, I kind of, I, I went away from the national team in 2007 mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of years, four years. Yep. Um, Were you with them in 2004? That, yeah, uh, I didn't go to that Olympics. I okay. didn't make that team as well. <laughs> that was, but, that, was uh, that story to tell, though, but go ahead. Huh? No, so I said like, a lot uh, of stories um, to tell, but your turn. Sorry. Uh, I was saying like, um, you know, like a uh, mental toughness. I think uh, being like a player type coach, uh, player coach on some of those other teams, you know, it wasn't an ideal situation. And I had to think about the game a lot more and stuff like that. And then uh, also just becoming more mature, you know, because I think a lot of the years I was with the national team, I was kind of, I was kind of wild and I kind of did a some crazy stuff here and there and made some young, not great decisions all the shit. time. <laughs> young, young people shit. Were probably de detrimental yeah. to my, uh, my national team career. But, uh, you know, being away from that and, uh, you know, taking a look back and seeing like, oh, you know, I did uh, enjoy being with the national team. And, you know, it, it was a great thing to be there and have these uh, organized practices and stuff that you kind of take for granted. Because, uh, you know, I got out to the national team right after college and you had Long Beach State you know, an amazing program. And then you hop right into another ama amazing program, you know, and you never even realize. And even my first uh, two years overseas, we were at uh, Vienna in Austria with uh, Hugh McCutcheon. Two, you know, seven, seven, seven Americans both years in an awesome situation and pretty much uh, the USA program again. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's like, and a great coach. Yeah, a great coach and, uh, you know, three great coaches, you know, uh, Alan Knight, Doug Beal, and then uh, Hugh, and you just kind of, I mean, I, I did anyway. I kind of took it for granted and this and that and, you know, uh, stepping away from that and, you know, you seeing those guys win the Olympics, first of all, was like, wow, oh, man, that's, uh, you know, that's amazing, you know, because, you know, we didn't know if uh, they were going to win the gold or not or whatever. You know, we thought yeah, we were going to uh, do they well at the Olympics. But, you know, seeing them on the podium was uh, an amazing thing, you know, and, um, you know, just uh, being away from that, you know, kind of missing it and, uh maturing as a as a player coach thinking about the game more and so yeah i definitely think uh being uh playing overseas definitely helped my game my my game personally yeah i in my opinion i think a lot of americans thought that they could get back to the semifinals in 2008 you know, and very much like dane blanton who had um where him and fanoi had this goal to make it to the quarters right yeah. And then all of a sudden you make the quarters. You're like, okay, now our goals, yeah. you know, we got to move the finish line, you know, because we're not done yet. And then they play Portugal and Dane. If you ever listen to the podcast, just go into the option, Dane Blanton on YouTube or whatever. It's go 16 minutes and Dane tells that amazing story. Because like, if you remember back then, it was side out. Oh, really? It, was, it wasn't rally. It was side out in 2000. It was, it was. Hey, I, I mean, I, I saw that gold medal match. It's so long ago. Well, I gold medal was it. two sets to 11 side out, but the semis yeah. was one set to 15 side out. So Dave, you played mm -hmm. enough beach and indoor uh, um, where you can play for almost an hour and the score is 10 up. <laughs> All right. So basically Dane's saying, and, and I'm, I'm me the whole time being the good podcaster, I'm editing highlights like the um, just highlights of the, you know, plays from from the Portugal um, semifinals. So Fenoy, it's 10 up. Fenoy hits the ball out wide. Right. And then they call timeout. And then when they come back from the timeout, the referee gives them a red card. And, you know, I'm trying to edit in. And then the referee just, boom. You know, the, I'm doing the video and you, and you can see the video of the ref doing this. Right. And then I'm doing a video, both of them like ready to lose their mind because and I'm, I'm telling you the story because i'm picturing in my head how you would fucking react if you're like it took all of his work just to get to 10 up and then we lose a point we get a timeout now now we're not down by one we're down by two and yeah. it's a game like if you don't have mental toughness and if you, if you don't have a championship mindset if you can lose and everybody understands because every yeah. this listen you're in malaysia right now but america this this is the land of excuses okay okay personal accountability <laughs> fuck that we're a nation full of finger pointers no so they if they lost everyone would have understood but what happens he gets the ball back ace position one like zone one wrist away ace out of zone, uh, zone uh position four or the beach players say zone four um Fenoy, block uh poke dane Dig, trans, kill. Now it's match point. Ace, jump serve, middle, game. So what took an hour to get to 10 up took an, 
maybe in a minute and 40 seconds <laughs> to get to 15 <laughs> points. And that was an awesome story. And, and the weird thing is, I'm so excited about telling. I don't even remember the logical co- connection and why, how this is supposed to come full circle. I'm usually better than that. So I, <laughs> so I apologize. Um, no, I think you, where your expectations are and once you get there, you're like, shit, we got to move the finish line. That's what I was getting at with 2000, sure. between 2004 and 2008. Because 2004, that was a miracle. That quarterfinals, yeah. you're against Greece, and, and you were listening to the podcast. They're down two yeah. sets to one. The score is 20 to 12. You bench Lloyd Boy. You put in Sujo, maybe to get some playing time, and then, well, you fuck around and win the game. <laughs> you know, and then the fifth set, 15 and up, someone blows the whistle in the crowd, and the only two people that kept playing were the setter and Millar. Set of one, boom. And then, and, um, Watch, watch last ep- last episode because I put in the highlight of the, all the Greeks looking at the ref because Ryan still didn't know. Like, he didn't know until I told him. This is years ago, uh, a decade later. <laughs> so, um, I really, really appreciate that answer because it was. I knew it'd be on the same wavelength with a lot of people who who share your um, volleyball IQ. Not to mention the pedigree of coaching that that teaches you that big waves crash, right? And that teaches sure. you um, at the high level as soon as you graduate college it's no matter where you go overseas you know it might be a shit show whatever but but you go to russia i'm telling you those those little gaps between you know and in seam a split seam they're closed and once you're out of system there's three guys and there are no holes you know so um very disappointed you didn't get your money for russia because russia for a 10-year period was the money league in the 90s it was italy and then um, during your time period, uh, all the way up to 2010, to the best of my memory, was um, Russia, and now it's Italy again, even though mm-hmm. Russia still has some pr- uh, a pretty good league. So let's go to college. Um, I want to start with the fun part. You hold the NCAA Division I uh, record for most kills in the match, 58. And this was against BYU, and this was against this was 1999. Two pretty good teams. How the hell do you get the number of attempts? <laughs> well, it's I, I no, it's still side out back then. It's ninety nine. So, side out, yeah, side but, out scoring. Up, but yeah. um, and and by the way, I played with the guy who's to, who holds the record for all the divisions. I I played college. I was at Hunter College for a cup of coffee, and then I played in Germany, and then finished my education at Marymount Manhattan. But Hunter had you know Elvis Rodriguez played for Hunter, and there were there, yeah. there were these great Dominican players. So I'm like, fuck it, I don't care if it's D three. These guys good ball. So the guy I played with, Haitian player Greg Romulus from um, a long lineage of players, holds the record 61 for 98. 61 for 98, five errors. Wow. Yeah, they That's played Roger Williams, and we lost. It made sports. <laughs> I had slightly more errors Yeah, than <laughs> but it made SI. It made SI because we lost. You know, yeah. your game, you won, right? That's the difference. Yeah. So my question is, what the hell makes you someone set you close to 100 balls? <laughs> Were you on fire? What the hell? Where'd that come from? I don't know if I was on fire. Um, you know, but those games could drag out sometimes. And, uh, you know, you're siding out a lot. So um, I think a lot of the important points he would, he would uh, setting me, like on D-balls and stuff, you know. But, I mean, I, I got blocked a lot. And I, 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 uh, I made quite a few errors, I think, in that match. I think it was like, I don't want to say it, like 25. <laughs> It averaged out to be a decent uh, hitting percentage and stuff like that in the end. But, like, uh, you know, the whole – I think I, I didn't even play the four set, really. I think I got subbed out or or didn't play the four – I can't remember exactly, to tell the truth. You know, but, uh, you know, he, he kind of – Cypher, uh, Chris Cypher was my setter, and he kind of trusted to give me a lot of balls. It happened in quite a few matches where he was giving me, like, 90 balls, 80 balls, something like that, and – you know, I was able to always uh, kind of bring it, and I think he liked that, you know, that I would, I would hit the ball because maybe some other guys weren't hitting the ball, you know, going yeah. for the point or whatever. Or but, they uh, would go with their safe shot, right? <laughs> hit, hit hard middle and try to beg Ooh. for a touch or some shit. I think I was pretty loud, too. I think uh, he's kind of the guy that when he heard the loud guy would kind of set it there. So maybe I was so loud that, you know, that was part of part of why he sent me. There was uh, – I played with the guy, Brandon Talaferro. He would set the loudest dude and. It was me usually, like when we played together, and he'd set like he'd always set the loudest guy, you know. So did you make a um, did you make a finals that year? Uh, yeah, that was, we that was ninety nine. <laughs> yeah, we got we got we got whooped in the finals. That they, was they against BYU, right? Really, yeah, no, this was at uh, UCLA at UCLA in Poly Pavilion. 
Oh, okay. But, dude, it was uh, it was over pretty quick. They were playing some uh, very good ball. You know, also uh, our outside hitter Jim Polster. Uh, I don't think he played. He he had uh, sprained his ankle. I think he sprained his ankle. Oh man! So that, sprained his ankle. That's is what, that right? No, 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 no. Maybe he did play. I can't remember now. I'm sorry. No. Well, the reason was, why uh, I was asking. Go ahead, please. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, the reason why I was asking because Greg who's like a brother from another mother. He's not just a friend where, um, you know how there's certain, certain teams you play with and you, you have these ups and downs and you're bound forever. Like 20 years later, yeah. 20 years later, you're still, you're still tight. Greg, in order for him to make 61 kills happen, my mother, the night before that game, said, you're going to church. <laughs> Mom, I have a game, right? There's no, I mean, I'm playing an NCAA game. No, you're going to church. Or, or you're getting the hell out of the house. I'm living with my mom at the time. So um, so <laughs> if I don't go to church, she's going to kick me out of the house and I'm sleeping on trains. So I know showed. Um, David May, Meng Young May, who was in Chinatown, he won Iron Horse, or a runner up for Iron Horse for the best player in the city. Mike Salek won. You might know Mike. Um, Mike played with Seydoux. So. Um, yeah. so David May's not there. I'm not there. Justin Stack, who's one of the most respected coaches on the East Coast, uh, was a freshman that year and that could play multiple positions. He was injured. So you have your three best uh, – um, well, Greg's, Greg's number one on the offense. But anyone that can back him up wasn't there. So you're talking dig at position six, pipe, just four. Not even like big, a back real quick anymore. Not even a, a tempo set. Just just throw it up and because he's so hot. And boom, you know, um, you know he, he pulls out of position four, dig in cross court, taking position five's dig. The, the, the guy literally took over a game. And again, wow. the only reason why this even made – news was because we lost it was it was on us i mean when does the division three team even get mentioned in sports illustrated we don't it's it's si but um 61 kills and lost and and tight 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 numbers so um you went to what high school did you go to you went to hunter uh, huntington right i went to yeah i went to uh huntington my junior and senior senior year huntington yep. beach high school nice dude and um wow a lot of good players huh ty trambley went there right did Ty Trample? Uh, actually, Ty went to Newport Harbor. Oh, okay. Ty's at Newport Harbor. Yeah. But we played, uh, he played at Balboa Bay. Okay. We played at Balboa Bay one of those years. Bal um, you know, Balboa Bay has enough to start their own city. Oh, they can they? just go to the woods. <laughs> they can go to the woods, chop down a few trees, make some can't some you know make some cabins, kidnap a few women, and 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 start their own community. <laughs> That's how many teams they have right now. Sorry, but Balboa Bay. Um, what club did you play with? Uh, so my, my, I moved out to California my sophomore year from Colorado. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I played with a team called Magnum. Uh, that was like Charlie Wade and Brian Hosfeld. And, uh, all the guys on my team, uh, were like these, uh, Esperanza kids from Yorba Linda. Uh, so we played on one team The my junior year, I played for Balboa Bay. And then, uh, my senior year, uh, me and those Esperanza guys, those Magnum guys, uh, made a new club. We called it, uh, Orange County Volleyball Club. And it was kind of a kind of a joke, kind of making fun of Los Angeles Athletic Club. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Orange County Athletic Club. We were uh, making fun of Los Angeles Athletic Club. Yeah. A little bit. Okay. You know, OCBC. at least there's no, no athletic club. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, we just were, you know, being idiots and made up a name. <laughs> but we That's made our so own club, uh, club up the last uh, year and we all played together again. We had a really uh, fun team, uh, really good friends. Everybody's really good friends. Mm -hmm. Throughout high school, I was always hanging out with those guys. I was always going up there and hanging out there. They were all my, you know, pretty good friends, and mm -hmm. so uh, it, it was nice to play uh, together again our senior year. You know, that's pretty cool, dude. I um, yeah. Well, one of my favorite players that came out of Huntington was um Ben Vaught. Uh, I don't know if you moved to Malaysia. Uh, Did he go to Huntington? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, he went to Huntington High School, and he was like, "Forget this college shit. I want to play beach volleyball." So, to his credit, at least he knew he wanted to what he wanted to do. You know, right now he's hooked up with the Harvard boy, Brandon Clemens. Um, um, Are they still playing? And, I saw I saw Brandon last time I saw it. I didn't see him uh, out there. I didn't see his name out there. He's That's playing with Dylan Marrick, 
And okay. Huntington Beach, actually, the Huntington Beach Open last year, I was coaching Jeff Samuels and Dave Palm. You know, if you know Dave okay. Palm, go yeah, way yeah, back. Yeah. And yeah. for me, I missed the easiest layup in the qualifiers. We ran into Ben, um, no, um, Brandon Clemens and Dylan Marrick. And uh-huh. they, Brandon Clemens had like different variations of cross court that. He's Jeff tough. and Dave were just stubborn. <laughs> they didn't want to. They, they they insisted on one blocking a guy who had different levels of cross. I'm like, you gotta, you gotta at least do like a three. Show him you lined up cross. You know, some kind of psychological <laughs> thing. And he, he teed off. And we chose to serve him because Dylan Mack was even better that day. And they 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 ended up qualifying. And um, you know, he he qualified with Ben Vaught. So I'm, I'm he's my. He's a hunk too, man. He's he's like you. He's a smoke. I think I'm a little gay for fucking Brandon Clemens right now. I don't. Maybe I'm maybe I'm bi. I don't. I don't question you. It makes you question your sexuality, honestly. So, um, I'm gonna ask you this question before I start talking too much. But I've asked everybody on uh, on most volleyball players, and I gotta ask you this. Otherwise, it would be podcast malpractice. At what point in your career? Or no, uh, let's just say, uh, maybe I use club or college as an example. Was there a particular mm-hmm. tournament or was there a particular match that you left that match or you left that tournament and told yourself, I think I could do this for real. I think I believe this is who I am and I think I'm really good at this. And I think, I think, holy, sh- holy shit, I think I, this is what I want to do when I, I mean, you. We all, when you play volleyball, this is really what you want to be. But there's a there's a particular tournament or defining moment that divides what you want to be and the reality of like, wait, I am, I can be this. Uh, Was there I'm a, not sure. in college, I'm not sure if I had high school, one or club? single moment? But like, um, you know, there was always kind of like these these things that happened and then kind of move up to the next level, you know. Cause I wasn't really sure like if I was ever going to pursue volleyball, like I was in Colorado, we didn't really have volleyball. I was playing club volleyball. And then I, I moved out to California and I was supposed to just stay out in California for, for one season to play like high school and then uh club and then come back to Colorado. And then after that first season, you know, then uh, I was like, man, I got to stay out here. So I was like begging my parents to let me stay. I was, I was living with my sister, you know? And so uh, there was, there was that, you know, I was like, I wasn't expecting to stay there. We had some uh, fairly decent success. Okay, stayed out there. Uh, went from uh, Wilson High School over to Huntington Beach High School. It's like, oh man, like this is, you know, this uh, kind of legendary high school that's won CIF. Like, wow, yeah. this is something really else, is. you know. And then, uh, you know, um, going to Junior Olympics and having some success maybe in uh, in uh, Balboa Bay. You know, it's like I didn't. We, we I played on this Balboa Bay team that was also kind of we were good, but we weren't like great but then we ended up getting like a bronze our my junior year you know and so that was like well like you know we got to the like you were saying something like you get to the quarterfinals like, oh man maybe we, or uh you get to the, gold, the round, finish line. Yeah. Gold, gold, gold round maybe we can do better oh my gosh now we're in the the semi you know like, like oh my gosh you know so uh it just kind of kept going like that after that you know like uh, I, ne- I wasn't i never thought about college and then you know all of a sudden like you know colleges were recruiting and then you end up going to like Long Beach State, and even at Long Beach State, I didn't know if I, I should play or not. I never knew. Like, uh, I think maybe some other coaches probably had higher opinion of me than I did myself, so I wasn't really sure how far I could go with it ever, you know. And then uh, even going out to the national team, uh, e- even in high school and stuff like that, you know, I was kind of kind of undersized. Like a lot of dudes uh, from sophomore to junior year grew a ton, you know, like. Yeah. Oh, dude, everybody came but, back after, like, sophomore year, and everybody was, like, 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, yeah, and with and man like, voices. I was like, 6'2", <laughs> and I was like, dude, like, you know, and, uh, yeah, and with you know, men- in college, everybody's, uh, you know, pretty tall and stuff like that, and then, um, you know, I, I was, uh, got to the national team, I was playing opposite, and then coach told me, he's like, you can't play opposite, because you're, you're, like, 6'3", dude. Doug Beale said that to me. He's like, you better be an outside hitter. You got to be an outside hitter if you're going to be on this team. So I had to switch positions and, you know, uh, try a new position and stuff like that. And uh, I think that's ridiculous. So I wasn't too. really, I was just trying to kind of make it each time. You know, I didn't really have a, like any specific moment where I was like, okay, I'm going to, I can, I can really go far. Cause I never really thought how far ahead I could go, you know? Isn't it amazing? Kind of 
David, isn't it amazing when you look at the gold medal teams, and, and again, I'm only affectionately referring to the highest stage as an example, just for our, our audience, just so they can grasp this. Isn't it amazing that the gold medal teams are not the teams that are um, crewed up with height? Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, like Jiba's best player in the world, 2004. How tall is he? Karch Karai, yeah. multiple time best player in the world. How tall is he? Um, Taylor Sander, 2013, got best player in the world. How tall is he, right? Um, Riley Salmon, they don't beat Serbia, Montenegro in the quarterfinals to yeah. get to the semis or whatever. How tall is he? Graciously listed at six foot two, one. Graciously listed at six foot one. How sure. tall is Bruno, Alisson's partner that win the gold that was voted best player in the Olympics? I mean, so in this land of mytholo- mythological beast where coaches – and all of their their um their ego. I'm not saying be be ahead an ego, but you know the coaches I'm talking about from sure. this high perch. How tall are you? <laughs> <laughs> come no, you can never do this. You can never do that. Only for all of this to come full circle. Congratulations, MVP, <laughs> Dave McKenzie, and you're just like. <laughs> I'll take it. So I just think it's very interesting in the, on the land of mythological giants that it all comes down to the person who is your height. You're 6'4", 6'3", 6'4", right? Six four. Six four. But six it, four. it always comes down to someone your height or someone a little bit shorter than you. <laughs> Th- <laughs> thoughts on that? I think, I mean, there's just, there's something for being uh, very fundamentally, you know, something to be said for being very fundamentally sound, you know, in whatever sport, you know, fundamentals are everything. And, uh, you know, I think uh, one characteristic all those guys share is that they're just, you know, they're good in every aspect. And, you know, also like uh, they, they bring something to the team. They can make a play, obviously, you know, they're, they're there for their team. They can make things happen especially like in uh, pressure situations, they're not making errors, stuff yeah. like that. You know? Yeah, definitely. So I think, it, uh, you know, just being consistent, I think, uh, you know, as you get uh, bigger and taller, sometimes you lose like defense, you know, it's kind of like a, the stat bars on the video game. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know, like they're, they're better at blocking, but then it's diff- more difficult for them to get low and play D sometimes, you know what I mean? So, Smaller players sometimes, you know, smaller players for sure play better D. They're able to stay underneath the ball more. I mean, not not, not for sure, but I'm right. saying uh, it's easier for them to stay lower. So, you know, they're down like one inch, two inches lower. That's that much more time they got to get under the ball. That's you true. know, you see it on the beach. Yeah. That's why you're talking about these beach players. It's like, why are the, the short defenders? Man, they can rally. You know, they're able to get the ball. They're able to stay low. A taller player on D sometimes on the beach, it's like, it's kind of tough to stay underneath the ball when you're if you're like a yeah you see these guys just bending over they're not even using their knees they're just bending over forward or sideways folding up like you said (laughs) i always tell my friends you want your service you to get better just practice on a women's height net it's terrifying Oh, you dude, know, I, I, I i did that before trying to serve receive balls oh my gosh um, just like mm -hmm. that's terrible i was with a mayor i was uh with the mayor at lmu uh, Mayor's the the beach coach at Loyola Marymount yeah. University, and I, he brought me on, you know, on the coaching staff. And um, he's like, "Jay, you want to jump in?" I'm like, "Sure." Jay, you want to jump in? I'm sure. And then like, everybody watches me do this before service. <laughs> I'm like, "How's that Catholic thing go? Up, down, left, right? That's 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 how I want to do." It. But then I get on the men's net. I, you know what I feel like? I feel like a girl. <laughs> I get on the men's net. I'm like, "Yeah, I feel like a chick." So. <laughs> How um bring your attention to the Australian league? How fun was that? Uh, Austrian, Austrian. Oh, I Austrian. Austrian. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Austria, you know, uh, it's pretty. It's not a great league, you know. Yeah. We we were so our team was called like Hot Volleys, and then uh, we had like like I was telling you seven Americans there, so it was kind of like national B team. Yeah. Kind of uh, off season training type thing, and um, but at least a good fellowship, right? So. Oh, it was, I mean, our, our experience there was amazing. You know, like uh, we, we lived in the city in Vienna, which is an amazing city. Oh, you know, we went out like every weekend. It was a blast. We had, you know, just doing doing everything all the time. Uh, but, you know, like uh, our, our season there, uh, the, the league itself isn't that great. But we we did we played like 75 matches wow. you know, each season. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were traveling to Italy. We were playing against... Italian teams, we were playing in this uh, 
Euro Eastern Euro League. We were playing this other thing. We were playing in Champions League. You know, I mean, uh, it was a it was a crazy experience. You know, I didn't. People like say seventy five matches, but you're young. You don't care. You know, it's no, like, you don't even. Pretty awesome no. to play more matches. You know, I didn't. I didn't care. I don't Dude, know if the I, other guys. Did. When I was in the army, the Army European Championship started Thursday. And it finished Monday morning in the AM because it's double <laughs> elimination and it's side out and it's three out of five. So yeah, I got it. I didn't feel a thing. Like, I mean, no wonder you got 58 kills, right? You're just like, <laughs> yo, just set the young dude. or <laughs> just set the guy who's not feeling nothing. <laughs> but man, you come, you, if you're not careful, you can come back from overseas with a cane, <laughs> with a walking okay. cane. Greece is a lot, uh, as, a, as a league where a lot of people finish their careers from my understanding, <laughs> you know? Like my boy, Mike, my boy places, Mike Salak, I think finished his, his overseas career at Greece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of those courts are, are not uh, very forgiving. No. Like concrete right on top, uh, Terraflex right on top of concrete. Mm -hmm. You know, some of those older gyms and stuff like that. Did you, beat um, you up. did you get in some kind of trouble in Austria with, with the league or whatever? Or is that something you want to skip? Uh, no, I mean, we, in Austria. Or a, I, I saw something on your Wikipedia page that, that you got into some trouble with, uh, with, with um, WADA. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll skip that. Yeah, the hell with that. <laughs> hell with that stuff. I mean, look, if I had Alex Kleiman on the show, I skipped that too. You know, so. Um, no, I mean, it's it's nothing. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, we'll skip that one. But look, we both watch enough UFC to know. I mean, things are not what they seem. You know, like do you watch? Do you watch mixed martial arts? Yeah, all the time. I watch yeah, the time. like how many years did Junior Dos Santos have to have to sit out and f just for you saw well, just so for you saw to the city? We can, we can, we can talk about it. I don't mind actually. It's okay. not a big deal. So no, uh, I didn't think it. I mean, I didn't want to push you that way, but I'm. I mean, I don't know. I got I got a I got a, a positive uh, test on the thing on a, after a beach volleyball tournament there, and then uh, I kind of disregarded it because I I was like, well, whatever. And they were asking me to come. Uh, to like uh, write up a report about it or something like that or, or respond to something. And I was like, forget that. And they wanted me to fly to Australia for something. And I was like, dude, I was like for a beach volleyball tournament. I was like, dude, I was like, I think I want a hundred dollars or yeah, something like I'm that. like, who's, are you paying like, for well, this I kind of just brushed it off and mm -hmm. uh, I kind of wish maybe I hadn't because, uh, because I brushed it off, they um, gave me a maximum penalty of four years. Yeah, they suspend me for four years. And I was like, geez, like, well, I, I didn't know that was going to happen. I thought like they were going to suspend me for like six months because yeah. I, I didn't think it was a big deal at all. Right. And so like, because uh, you figure yeah, six it, months is just your off season and you're going to rest anyway, right? So, well, I, I, I mean, yeah. I, I wasn't really, I wasn't playing seriously at all. You mm -hmm. know, I was like going down there for fun and stuff like that, and uh, I brought the family down. And, yeah. You know, I spent like you know five thousand dollars to go down there to play a tournament with like no prize money and stuff like that. I didn't really think twice about it. So. Yeah, come on, dude. It's not like John Jones hiding under the ring. Did you hear that story? John Jones no. hiding under Usada came and he hid under the ring. <laughs> what did he do? He hid under the his training facility there, Jackson Wink. What? The, he hid under the um the they they have a cage and they have a ring. So when Usada came, he ran under the ring and hid, and they said he wasn't there. <laughs> but that look, the dude was doing admittedly he was doing cocaine he was oh. doing weed he was it's i have a huge problem with you saw i don't know nothing about water but i have a huge problem with you saw because there's certain things on that list the band's list that yeah. you can get at gnc and that are perfectly sure. legal and that enhance your quality of life and healthy and then you have things that are illegal like you can go to jail for cocaine, but it's not a banned substance. <laughs> but it's not a banned substance on USADA. So actually, let's do the MMA a little bit. Did you get a chance to see Anderson Silva? Um, Anderson Silva fight? fought Uriah Hall. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that last I, fight. Was, I can't. I didn't expect to be so emotional. I didn't uh, expect to I be didn't. so emotional. I love me some Anderson Silva. Go ahead. No, I just. Uh... I mean, I, you kind of knew what the outcome of that fight was going to be. You know, I, I I didn't think you know Anderson Silva can compete with that guy. But then, uh, did you think he was winning the whole time until he lost? Though, did you um, think he won the first? I thought he won personally. I thought I he won, won the, the first, first two rounds. Round or whatever, but then, yeah, first round. I mean, I, yeah. Then you see him win. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know. I just I I, I kind of don't like uh, how they do that in the UFC. Like 
with these legends even you know they kind of feed them to the dogs you know and then it's like this uh the the younger guys uh, way up you know and another win on their their belt and then they're kind of just get beat That's up like, and like yeah they're laughing uh, by it. it's, not, it's not i don't know I, I don't like that it is kind of like dana taking the dog to the yard and does like, it a lot and like pull, and like <laughs> you know, the with, well i think uh, it's still happened with bj penn these... right huh with bj penn you know i think he's he's had a lot uh, a few matches too long and i think i agree with you. i think like not just for his legacy but it hurt me too much to see him there and i'm like please don't get hurt too badly like when when your hall business, hits you with something you're not going to recover from please don't get hurt too badly yeah that's the business you know i mean i think uh they want to promote the next guy so they want to get a good win under his belt and you know hype yeah. him up for the next thing or whatever you know yeah who do you who do you like right now in the ufc um i really like Khabib, man you know Habib was like just uh, his work ethic, his you know uh, his, everything about him, you know, just a, as a as a person, you know, he's just a good guy, you know, and uh, I really I enjoyed uh, watching him. I was surprised he, he uh, retired. I didn't know the whole little backstory, you know. So that was about pretty, his mom, uh, yeah, his yeah, mom about saying, the, all about the dad and all yeah. that. I didn't know all all that, and, and I heard also he had a broken foot. So. You never see him uh, complain about that. Yeah, so that he had a broken foot, and so he he uh, fought that that last uh, that last fight with a broken foot, and didn't say anything about it, and just you know, I really like him. Uh, it's it was kind of I like what, what was that last fight? Um, it yeah, it was it was that last Justin fight. Justin Gaethje. But I was saying it, it was kind of nice, yeah, to see him and Gaethje, but uh, being humble, both of them, you know, because you don't see a lot of humble. No. Because these people trying to sell tickets, and, you know, yeah. and it's part of the game. It's part of the sport, but it's just like it was, was kind of nice to see, especially for like a main draw for a a title a title fight for, to see those guys uh, yeah. be so humble and respectful of each other. You know? And Khabib sells too. Khabib's got a yeah. huge popula a population following because That's of true. what he doesn't say. Isn't it weird? Like you look at McGregor or maybe uh, Israel Adesanya, he has a huge following because you don't know what he's going to say or do next. And for that, that ex and for opposite that reasons, terrible. <laughs> no, but and for op but opposite reasons, Khabib has the same number of followings for reasons opposite to that. So two reasons I like Khabib. The higher the level he fought, the more he was getting finishes. Everyone called him a decision machine, but if you look at his last three matches, they were their base and one fifty five. You know, is a bunch of freaking savages. That they're they're you they're killers all the way up to fifteen. One one to fifteen. So to take your last three matches against the top competition and and win all of them, not just sleep somebody, not for a ref to come in and say he's had enough, but for you to say. To say uncle and Justin Gaethje, to his credit, went out. Ta I think tapped out once and then went out. I, I couldn't yeah. even really, really see that. That's that's one reason I like him. Here's the second reason why I like him. I am from Brooklyn, New York. And when you talk all this nonsense, like I, I the reason why I don't hate I hate this this whole talk crap thing in the UFC. It's okay to talk about someone's wife, right? To talk about someone's religion, to talk about someone's father. You know, it's, it's okay to do all that tough guy stuff. But every now and then, you run into one of these bad motherfuckers that don't play that shit. Um, Masvidal. Masvidal don't play that, that, that mess. And, he, and, and Askren paid the price. Khabib doesn't play that mess. And you pay the price. So where I'm from and my upbringing... Like if the way I was taught, if someone keeps doing that to you, you have to defend yourself because if you don't, um, they think they could do it every time they want. That's that's the way Brooklyn people think. Like if someone robs you by gunpoint, you're like, no, shoot me because because now you know it's like you'd rather die than let this guy keep doing it again and again and again. So that's the reason I like Khabib because it reminds me so much where I, where I came up from. Like you, okay. You're making money, you're doing, you're talking all this mess, but sooner or later, it comes back full circle. And when it does, you can't play the victim. You can't play yeah. the victim. Like, I talked to Casey Jennings, and Casey's like, oh, that was classless, like Khabib jumping out in the crowd. And I'm like, Casey, you know, this ain't the South Bay where you could stare down people and mean mug people, and and it's all part of the game. Some people don't, some people don't play that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, the emotions are running high. And yeah. And he had a he had a point to prove, and things got crazy. But I mean, I don't know. McGregor, I, I felt like uh, really stepped over the line. Mm. You know, like like you were saying. Uh, you know, like I think you you can talk about those things, but you gotta you gotta realize who you're talking to, and 
you know, these, these guys are like living in the village, dude. <laughs> so it's like, you talk about their religion and their mother or father or something like that. I mean, you, you've, you've stepped over the line way too far, you know, yeah. like as, as we saw, you know, his dad's like his, his everything, you know? So you talk about his uh, dad or something like that. You're you going to take it. And, yeah. and he didn't say anything yeah. back. He, he just yeah. made a mental note. He did the Dan Henderson, <laughs> Dan Henderson thing with Michael Bisbing. I ain't saying nothing back. Make a mental note. Take it out of his ass. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, but it's weird because I'm bringing it back to volleyball. I was coaching club for Evolution. Duncan Avery, uh, one of, um, actually one of um, Al Alan Knipes, um Jedi's, <laughs> you know, and when he's got a bunch of acolyte, um, acolytes all over the place and horsemen. Um, I coach a club at a Redondo beach. They're all re at Redondo high school. All of the kids go to Redondo and South. And there was a kid, you know, a team that beat us. And the kid, the way the kid shook my hand, he's looking at me. Right. So I look back and I look away. I look back and he's still doing this, like staring me down. So I look at him. Right. And I look at his coach and it's to see if his coach sees it. His coach sees it. Coach does this. I look at his See if his parents are here, and I can't find his parents. And then instead of telling my team bring it in, what I do is I go under the net, and I say, guys, bring it in. His, the, the other team, and the guy's just like, I'm like, hey, come on, everyone bring it in. I said, first of all, congratulations, you guys played an awesome match. I said, with that being said, you need to be careful about um, the, way you, the way you look at people and the way you act when you're winners. Because there's, there's this huge sore winners mentality in, in the South Bay that, that they, okay, be cocky, but, but, but I said, listen, you're going to go to nationals and you're going to play a team from uptown New York, an all Dominican team. And where, and where they're from, if you do that, that means you're fighting. <laughs> so that means that means you're throwing down so i'm like it's fun now and me i can take it and this and that but and i said don't take anything away from your victory other than the, then you're the better team the better team won and i said does everybody everybody understand me and they all said yes coach and the, the other coach is like well your guys were talking stuff too and i'm like that's not what i'm talking about and then the parents come to me what did you say to my son and i said i just told him to be careful and they're like you shouldn't and i'm like well, i'm like well you should you failed. You failed this kid as a parent because he's gonna get he's gonna get popped in his mouth, and then all of a sudden you're gonna call the other team classy, classless. But, um, and it was it's such a weird story. And I'm glad I'm not gonna mention the team's name, but I, but I coach Evolution, and and it's just a weird thing I had to get used to when I moved out here. When I moved out here, the sore winners mentality. You know, <laughs> um, do you miss California? Different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We, I didn't. I never. I didn't understand uh, South Bay. We had some uh, some players that came to Long Beach State, um, or the, even in, uh, when I was a freshman and stuff. But like just uh, the attitude and stuff like that. And I, I didn't understand what they were, why they were like that, or what they were, like what their deal was. Why you know? are, and yeah. Then, why uh, you bugging I, out? <laughs> well, yeah. But then I, I came up to the South Bay and uh, started hanging out with these guys more, and you know, I, I kind of got to appreciate their humor and everything like that and you, you kind of get it then if you don't if you don't know them then you're like oh my gosh what's up with these guys yeah. you know yeah I'm, what's I'm wrong a, with these I'm guys but then, uh... your mouth, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so god what was i gonna say it was i i really really appreciate it now now that i live here you know and now that i um I, you get to know some of these kids and and they're just having fun you know, I, I over, I'm maybe in retrospect, I overreacted, but at the same time, that was super necessary because you don't want him to do that outside of SCVA. You know, you well, don't that's want. The, that's the thing is like, they kind of get outside the bubble a little bit. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, other people cannot understand what's wrong, what's up with these guys. You know, and that's and the, like a lot of say we had some kids come there yeah. and like, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to fight our freshmen. I was like, dude, like, what's wrong with you, kid? Let's go. <laughs> you know, and then, uh, mm -hmm. You know, after being up there, you kind of understand. Well, and, and the adults are even worse. Like I set for, for a team, uh, Bameso. They yeah. won um, nationals in 2004 and 2005. Batista, actually, from BYU ended up playing. Um, he, play, he, he played with him. I didn't go to nationals with him, but I set for them, you know, got the bid with them. And these are, a, I'm the only guy on the team that spoke English, first of all. All right. Um, they say they're from North Carolina, but... Come on, David. They're, they're all from Mocha, Santa Domingo, or Washington Heights. <laughs> Washington Heights, upside up, uptown New York. Okay, kiss my ass. So they and Paul Mitchell almost had a full blown fight at Nationals uh, because of 
like I said, that whole mentality that from childhood to a, this was 2006. Oz, um, I wanted to talk to Oz Borges about it because Oz um, played for Bameso. Oz was um, a, cu- a Cubano on an all Dominican team, really. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, the whole team is, is again, Mocha and Santa, you know, Santa Domingo, yeah. you know, all the Haitian guys, you know, are just Creole guys. And now Creole got white guys on the team, too. But but um, it was just I, I just thought it was a cool story to tell because you 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 were in Colorado. You're in the South Bay. You played overseas. You meet this different personality. Long Beach State, of course, the recruiting ba- uh, base is not just local uh, talent, right? Course, right. Yeah. When they were repeat champions, their best outside hitter, that first one was from Norway, that Norwegian kid, number four. Sure. I don't, I don't know what it was or whatever. Um, Lewis Richard, um, the next team, uh, the only, the only African American on that team that I could see was an outside hitter. Um, he's one of our coaches too for Evolution, by the way, and he went to Redondo High School. You. He's like a black McKenzie. You you'd love him. He's smiling all the time. His he's got an arm, you know what I'm saying? He's he's not like a teammate where you have to deal with your teammate. You know what I'm saying? You I mean, I thought you you look, you were probably more of a knucklehead off the court because you probably wanted to have fun yeah. and party and maybe 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 I don't know, maybe your training habits are different. I'm br- I'm dr- drawing presumptions that you could just interrupt at any point. Um cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. <laughs> Do you miss California? Huh? Do you miss California? Uh, not really. You know, I mean, uh, we, we usually go back for about four months in the summer, you know. Uh, last year didn't come back because uh, my son had uh, just been born uh, in November. So, like, uh, didn't really want to travel with a kid. Didn't really, you know. How old? They take care of a baby all summer. How old? <laughs> and, outside the house it's kind of just a you know hassle i i, I thought you know and then uh this year obviously couldn't travel because of this uh whole mess so uh you know i, I miss it a little bit now but uh you know I, every time i go back it's it's like I, I was just there you know i don't feel like uh i'm missing out on anything it's the same as uh always playing overseas you know i was always gone all year you know and then come back it feels summer, like you never left, you know? right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. It's almost exactly the same. So that's how I feel about New York. Yeah. Yeah. It's I like go, you never left. It's like it's yeah. like you were there yesterday, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean that's how I feel like look, so. co- yeah, COVID can go kick rocks because I, I go back to New York twice a year. One in, once in the fall because it's nice fall weather, autumn weather. You got the leaves falling. You know, it's jacket, jeans, and boots weather. You know, wear a blazer. You can chill, walk through Central Park. It's pretty cool weather. You know, go to the theater. And then in June, yeah. the AVP New York, I'm most likely coaching a, a team, or or um, at the time and or July. Andor, the guy played for UCLA. Yeah. I was doing, I was doing the beat for volleyball one on one, like beat, beat um interviews and reporting for yeah. him. So, so I always find myself in New York for those reasons to coach or to commentate, which um, which is awesome. But how is COVID in Malaysia? Why, how are you guys handling that in Malaysia? You know, they had a lockdown and then uh, they they lifted uh everything up, uh, all the all the regulations, and then uh, now they're kind of having like a like a, a second wave. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, they kind of put in this uh, lockdown again, but then it's kind of like uh, going through the motions because, like, people are wearing the masks and uh, they say it's like a, a move, movement restriction order, but then uh, it's almost exactly the same as when it was normal, but you can't have, like, more than two people in the car and the the, the restaurant closes at six. Right. <laughs> six instead of 10 and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's just like some kind of funny rules that really don't uh, seem to be that, that would be that effective, you know, because yeah. everybody's doing exactly what they were doing anyway. Inside so, their house. Yeah. But, with their but, family. You, but, but you can only be two people in the car and then you, the restaurants close at like uh, 10 instead of one, <laughs> 10, 10 PM instead of 1 AM. I miss karaoke, but, David. Huh? I miss karaoke, man. I'm dying over <laughs> here, dude. I'm dying. I twice a week. When you listen for guys like you and me, when our escapism becomes your career, you kind of need a, another outlet. So for me, because my BFA is in acting, it was uh, theater performance. Go to karaoke, pick something from musical theater, pick something from a movie, express myself, get all that sure. stuff that has nothing to do with anything, and express yourself through song. You know, Tower Twelve <laughs> or Fast Offenders, uh, which is now Tower Twelve. I'm I'm there. Hennessy's Monday night, and. Um, we're dealing with COVID really well. Hermosa Beach is where I live right now. We're dealing with it better than Manhattan Beach and Redondo. We're just, you know, quarantine becomes quarantine. 
you know, a bunch of people get get tested. They're all negative. Are you um, shut down right now? Huh? No. I, I, oh God. No, we're just we're just being smarter. Manhattan Beach is, and Manhattan Beach looks like a fucking zombie apocalypse. It really does. You know, you ever see The Walking <laughs> Dead, like the herd mentality? <sighs> And you know, no one stops the hurry. You're just trying to move out of the way. That's I'm like, I'm looking at these outdoor restaurants. I'm like, good for you. You got an outdoor restaurant and everybody's like on top of each other. It's it's insane. I can't even I can't even imagine something like New York where even millionaires are living on top of each other. I mean, and how they yeah. had to deal with that and how they, they've come back from that. So uh yeah, so I was just curious about the Malaysia situation and this and that, but but um yeah, I, I love being here right now, dude. I love being here right now. Did you play against Casey uh in BYU? I know Casey yeah. Jennings. Uh, he he got to. I know he, he didn't play. He didn't start a lot of games. But sorry, he played. Uh, he played here and there. You know, he would uh, come in and play. But uh, I knew Casey for a long time. You know, I knew him uh, all through in high school. He, mm-hmm. They had, he'd come out from uh, Las Vegas to to Golden West, and I was always around those guys. We'd come down and watch him play beach. Him and Scotty Lane. You know, uh, but yeah, I, I just got to. Casey just, I think he just played that one year at BYU, right? Um, I think two. I think he transferred from somewhere. He's Listen, he's one of those guys that's gotten shunned and had to do things the hard way, which is why he's so grouchy all the fucking time. But Casey <laughs> is my dude, man. I, 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 we, we looked each other in the eye and we became friends right away. That's just, that's just the way it is. And uh, I, I just like you and uh, guys like you and me, where we grew up with people that have crazy ideas but we still love them to pieces. He, he, yeah. I, mean, I know he thinks I have crazy ideas, and I think I, he has crazy ideas. But like you, like we said before this started, and we're not going to talk about the, the 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 election and all that other stuff. But you shouldn't be defined by who you vote for. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, you, you, you've known you known this person your whole life. You never met that dude. And you never met that dude in your life. Just, just, he's a great guy. yeah. He's, he's, isn't no, he's, he awesome? Uh, he would fight for you. Isn't he you awesome? Know? He would, he would he, take a bullet for you, dude. You know? he, I mean, if anybody, you know, if you say something wrong in front of him, he'll correct you. He's not afraid to, you know, he's always uh, uh, been a really good guy. And, and he sticks uh, up for his friends, too. Yeah, you say so, something I mean, about his friends, saying. he's ready to scrap. You say something about Kerry, you 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 know, he's ready to die. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that podcast with Kevin Burnett when he criticized like P1440 for like 20 straight minutes. He had some oh, yeah. He had Lion King on the podcast, but at the end, what the hell are they doing? I don't know what they're doing. They don't have a crowd and Kerry out. Kerry doesn't know what she's doing and this and that. One episode later, that was Friday, the following Monday, who's on the show? <laughs> yeah. Oh, who's on the show and trying to mediate in the middle is rich lamborn and um dj roche are kind of in the middle and lamborn's like like that. it was the most <laughs> cringeworthy most uncomfortable thing i've ever seen but but the, the point i was trying to make if you you mess with carry you mess with him you mess and same thing with his friends so um partner that beach partner that you considered the best condition athlete that you played with um, that i played with yeah um, more than Marchuka for sure, right? <laughs> Wasn't much. <laughs> Gosh, I played with so many guys. Who have I played with? Um, I mean, my favorite partner, I guess, uh, Hudson Bates. You know, he kind of had a an issue with getting gassed, but I mean, he was in in pretty good shape. You know, just uh, he was so heavy that uh, if we got into longer matches, it would, he would he would be burning. I mean, he was like dying. Yeah. There were a couple he, matches he was, he was like dying. He had muscles in places. <laughs> he's a guy I don't even have places. Up to the limit and yeah, he was, uh, he was he was always in pretty pretty awesome shape, you know. The partner you had the most fun with off the court. Uh, my partner. Always yours. Oh, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe like uh, I think I played one with John Kuhn. Okay. Or maybe uh, Greg Garrett, like in a qualifier. Uh, I, I don't know. How about someone who's not your partner? As, as we got into the beach later, I, I wasn't going out so much and partying. So how much? How about someone who wasn't your partner that you had the most fun with? Oh, I don't even know. Probably a lot of. So many of them. <laughs> <laughs> Damn! I only asked that because because I, I thought you had something to say, man. <laughs> 
Oh man. So any um side ventures? Uh, we're we're gonna wrap up in a little bit because I I, t- I think I took it as far as I could go. You and you're God knows you're still up. You're you're up all night just for this. And you God, you have my respect and you've always had my um admiration. I'm I don't, I'm not a big fan of players as much as I am for the sport, but I've always find you this intriguing person. So um, anything you want to plug? Any site or any 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 venture? Um, anyone that wants to get to know Dave McKenzie, just find you on Instagram. Not sure. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, it is what it is, Jay. Cool. All right. So listen, that's that's all I got. And for everybody listening, Dave McKenzie might love you, but I had enough of you. All right. So for all of you at home, for all of you at your iPad at Starbucks, for all of you on your droid, for all of you on your desktop, who runs the world? Old school, old school. For Dave the enigmatic McKenzie. This is episode 64, and I'm Jason DeBeas, and we both say, I'm going to roll my credits and you stay with me. We're out. Come check out the Option Podcast on optiondb.com. It's also available on iTunes and Spotify and on YouTube under the NY Varsity Sports Handle. You're going to love what you hear.